uh, some, somehow we've gotten kicked off. I don't know, somebody hit the button. So we're live, folks. Somebody hit the launch button. Well. <laughs> Um, I would like to thank you guys. I don't know if I'm supposed to talk now or yet, but uh, really, this is a, a tremendous, tremendous effort uh, put forth. So thank you guys. Certainly, as you said, the 500 guys appreciate it, but around the world, patients appreciate it. So thank you, thank you. Uh, I just looked, and we've almost had 1,000 views. That does not include the people who participated in Peter Carroll's. Uh, presentation which was the first one in the series yep. so I think, I think we're at 937 views for peter carroll and i'm hearing i hear all the time i mean these guys are really living as so i tend to stay um on the outside uh largely because most of the advocacy i do is for advanced disease prostate cancer but also because ANCAN has a lot of other interests, and um, we we minister to 11 different conditions, so we're not just prostate cancer. Uh, but that said, I keep hearing from people how uh, how great Peter's presentation was. So um, I'm I'm really grateful we've done this. And by the way, you you wouldn't know this, but uh, Peter was one of the people that got me into advocacy originally because I served on his patient advocacy committee at UCSF going back to about 2008. That's awesome. So we go back a long way oh. here. He and uh, we had we had Peter on that and we had Mac Roach on that, which is an interesting combination. I want you to know. <laughs> <laughs> So Mac Mac was my own personal doctor. So um but you know I love Mac. He's an acquired taste, but I, he, I I've acquired the taste. <laughs> That's the most so can important. I check in? Can you hear me? Yeah. We can hear you, Howard. We can we okay. Can, Howard, and just a heads up that for whatever reason we're not quite sure we're live. Yeah, and Rich, Rich indicated that we could try to reboot the webinar, but I'd rather not if we can just maintain this as casual conversation for a few minutes. That well, might be just as well. Currently, we have 42 total attendees, including us. And we bumped into this last time that up until the actual start time, this would be considered a practice. So we could if, restart. If you want to go that direction. What do you think, gang? Well, we, either, we, we either need to just stay cool for 10 minutes or uh, try to restart. Or just, just mill around smartly and make entertaining small talk for the folks that are early. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, won't, it won't hurt for a few people to understand what it takes to run one of these things, I guess. But it, uh, you know, just be selective about what you say. That's all. Well, the problem is it will also show up on the recording. Exactly. <laughs> well, uh, so I think what we should say for the sake of the recording is that if anybody is listening to the recording, you can fast forward about nine minutes to the beginning because uh, we don't want to take your time if you're listening to the recording. Is it that might find it interesting. They might find it interesting, Rick. <laughs> um, well, I am not going to participate in this technical discussion. I defer to our technical wizards, wherever you, whoever you are. I know who you are. So, um, if, if you think we can make small talk, Elliot, make, yeah. make, Elliot, could you give us a song, maybe? <laughs> No, but um, so there's this guy who goes to his proctologist. And, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that's Howard's department. <laughs> uh, Elliot can tell a pretty good joke. So. Oh, thank you. I, I really only I think, know. I think, 
<laughs> yeah, I know. I think I've heard that one already. <laughs> uh, Dr. H, you've probably got a few good ones up your sleeve as well, don't you? <laughs> on, a, on a daily basis. On a daily Yeah, I know. Mean, so. There are very few that are reused. <laughs> you know, I asked uh, Dr. Carroll the last time if he had any good um, prostate jokes. And, and he says, I'm not a good joke teller. So that was kind of a smooth way to get out of it. So, Brian. I, I would like, uh, I would have to agree. I'm not a, uh, I, I like to kind of see what's going on versus one of those who can just tell jokes off the whim. There are certain people who are very skilled at that. I don't know if uh, that's where my efforts lie. Mm. Well, I know. I, no, I just, I just, it was like Debbie Downer. People are going to look at this video and be like, oh, Brian's not even funny. Turn off, go somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, Brian, now, Brian grew, grew up here in Chicago, and uh, he was like a fish out of water because he, he was a White Sox fan in a Cubs area. And we're, we're very strictly segregated that way. Uh, but I, I, I didn't look. Did the White Sox win today? They did. Um, so we're, we're, we're going strong. We're hoping uh, we, we kind of let it loose a little bit just to give ourselves a break in the end few games and certainly playing the Cubs Crosstown Classic recently. But I think we got a shot this year. So we'll see. Not much of a season, though. Not at all, <laughs> but maybe that's to our advantage. <laughs> that's uh, that's fighting talk that I hear. Woo! Um, I'm impressed. I actually um, I, I I attended a, a conference in Chicago two years ago um, that was at the Swiss Hotel, and uh, one of the guys that we support um, knew I was coming into town and uh, took me to Wrigley Field, which was a, a real thrill because I had lived, I lived in Chicago when I went to graduate school. Um, and I, I went to the old Chicago stadium. That was the first basketball game I ever saw in my life. Uh, and, um, and I went to the old Chicago stadium um, I think I've been to Soldier Field, but I had not been to Wrigley Field, and I haven't been. I haven't been to the White Sox. Uh, it's it's a complete different experience between the Wrigley Field um, and now Guaranteed Rate Field. Different set of uh, fans. I like to think that the real fans at uh, White Sox Park. Not so much. Uh, it's a good time. And uh, I, I certainly haven't uh, shied away, but it's definitely you need to like baseball to go to a uh, guaranteed rate. Well, yeah, uh, Rick, I, I've lived here 70 years. I've never been to Wrigley Field, so you got me beat. Oh, wow. I, I grew up on the south side. Right. And, you know, there's some borders, we, we some thresholds we never cross. Well, so. I, I understand that. That would be like my going to White Hart Lane in London. So if you say so, yes. I get it. Yeah, well, anybody, anybody who knows anything about English soccer will know what that makes me. But but Dr. H, you don't sound you don't have a Chicago accent. Somehow mm -hmm. I, I oh, escaped yeah. it. My parents have a very strong accent. So oh, wow. maybe I was. Interesting, interesting. So I got. I'll tell you my Chicago Stadium story because it's actually a good. It's a good one. So this was um, this was the Bulls playing the Warriors when the Warriors were good before all their years of being bad. So they had uh, Rick Barry and Norm Nixon, um, and I can't think who else. And the Bulls. Uh, there was um, Norm Van Leer, Storm and Norman, and um, and Jerry Sloan, God rest his soul, and um, Nate Thurman, and I. That, those so those are three. Anyway, and Tom Borwinkle 
was the reserve center. So we're right up in the Bob Uecker seats, way, way, way at the top. I'm there with my, my two roommates from I was in grad school. And um, we get back down to the very bottom and I look and I put my hand in, in, in my coat and I drop my wallet because I'd taken my coat off. So I have to go all the way back up to the very top to get my wallet again. And so I go all the way up the stairs and I get to the top. Fortunately, my wallet is there on the floor under my seat. I go back and I see there's an elevator. So I get in the elevator and um, the elevator stops at like level one. And the biggest person I've ever seen in my life gets in and my, my jaw drops. And it's Tom Bullwinkle who was this enormous white guy about seven foot one. And from there on out, I had a whole different perspective of what basketball players were. <laughs> it was different. I, I definitely tried hard, hard through the years, but I, you're right. I, I didn't uh, have the, the stature of a, a typical basketball player. I, I like to think that's the only thing that held me back. Otherwise, I was there. <laughs> Listen, well, I mean, look who the original basketball players were. You probably could have been in the original league. <laughs> that is true. You know, that is true. You, um, you maybe should think about challenging Mac next time you're uh, in San Francisco for a conference. And I, the word is he has a hoop in his backyard and he'll take on anybody. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it would be a game. It would definitely be a game. <laughs> okay, guys, we're coming up on seven o'clock. Okay. okay. Everybody that needs to, make sure you pop out your question chart and your chat windows. That doesn't happen for Brian, but anybody else that's going to be interacting so that you'll have them there. You can, you can pop them out by the diagonal box and then uh, expand them to your pleasure. And Mr. Mason is here. Alexa made him an organizer, so. Good. I hope he can hear us. Uh, I don't get any recognition of it. So, Joe, okay. I, should, I should be turning my camera off, yeah? Uh, yes, Every everybody should be turning off their webcams at this time. And then what we'll do is turn them on uh progressively as we go through so that'll be rick and then uh jim and then on to howard okay so that when you're not on you can turn yours off and do you want me to turn mine off as well uh yes yes please until you're until you're presented you'll be fine all right we're, we're going to end up starting this a, a, a little bit less than smoothly but uh, I think uh, we've, we've reached the uh, hour. It is uh, seven o'clock in the east of the United States. Uh, I would say good evening, uh, but one of the things that we need to consider is that we have a much larger audience uh, in many uh, different geographies. Uh, our registration is in excess of 500, uh, and we have, uh, plus the United States, uh, 16, other countries uh, that have registrants in the uh, for this conference. Uh, so I'm Joe Gallo. I'm with ANCAN. On behalf of uh, ANCAN and uh, us too, I'd uh, like to just go over a few administrative things and then we'll get immediately into the program. Uh, if you are not familiar with how to use the control panel, which is on your screen on the upper right hand side, uh, there's a video that I sent out to you earlier, uh, so hopefully everybody's got that, but that'll just show you how to take advantage of the, uh, the, the question box. Also for phone callers, anybody who's just coming in on the phone, uh, I also sent in your confirming and uh, uh, reminder emails, the uh, how to link to get copies of uh, uh, Dr. Helfand's uh, slides. So obviously uh, you'll, you'll want to see those. So that information is there for you as well. Uh, the other aspect is the question box. 
Uh, you can put your questions in. We've had a number of questions that have already come in prior to uh, today, and you can enter your questions, and then we'll be managing them from that uh, from that window, um, and we'll we'll pick that up immediately after the uh, the presentation. Uh, the only other recognitions I like to have is that we do have some co-sponsors. Uh, that is Zero, the end of prostate cancer, the PCRI, PCAI, and Cancer ABCs. So uh, all joined in, in giving us support for this uh, program tonight. And with that, I will turn it over to Rick. Rick Davis from ANCAN. Thank you, Joe. And uh, I want to extend a really warm welcome to everybody uh, that's joining us now, everybody who will join us, and everybody who watches this on the um, subsequently on our recording, on our YouTube recording. Uh, I just noticed today that for our first presentation with Dr. Carroll, Peter Carroll, uh, we've had over uh, almost a thousand views already, um, and that increases daily. Um, so I'm welcoming you on behalf of ANCAN, and uh, in particular, uh, the uh, prostate cancer activities. Um, we run 11 groups just for prostate cancer each month. Uh, these are all video chat virtual groups, and if you go to ancan.org, you'll find out how to sign up for them. Uh, and um, great, huge thanks to Howard Walinski, who's on our advisory board, who came up with this idea of having this focus on active surveillance, both in terms of our virtual groups, which will soon be once a week, and in terms of this webinar series. Um, I'm sure you're going to enjoy the presentation um, and that uh, Dr. Helfand is going to give Dr. Carroll a very good run for his money. I'll pass it on to uh, to Jim Schreit, my uh, the board chair of us two. Hi, I'm I'm Jim Schreit here on behalf of us two this evening. Uh, thank you and welcome. Um, us two, for those of you who don't know us, is probably best known for the approximately 200 um, affiliated support groups that we have nationwide. Uh, in addition, we have a, a website and um, work to produce and, and sponsor educational programs such as this one. Um, we're very happy to be here tonight. Uh, active surveillance is a topic that is of, of huge importance to us too. And we're, we're very, very happy to be a part of this program today. Um, I know I'm not supposed to be introducing Dr. Helfand, but um, I just have to give him a shout out. I think, you know, he is one of the uh, best friends to the prostate cancer community. He's been uh, a serial uh, Ask the Docs doctor at, at our Sea Blue event, Sea Blue fundraising event, as, as recently as a couple of weeks ago. And I, I just, I can't say enough about what he does for patients and the uh, patient community. So I hope you enjoy this uh, evening's program and uh, enjoy. Okay, we're handing off to uh, Howard Walensky now who will do the formal introduction and then we'll get into the presentation. Oh, well, good evening, everybody. Uh, Howard Walensky as previously announced. I'm one of the organizers of the, of the webinar. And I'm also a moderator on uh, Active Surveillance Support Group, uh, which is supported by ANCAN and us too. I, I ran a survey recently of patients on active surveillance, and I found that three quarters of them wanted a program on genomics. That was second only to the 80% who wanted a program on imaging prostate cancer. And we have one of those coming up in November. People want to know the difference between genetics and genomics, whether they may be candidates for such testing. Our goal tonight is that uh, you will leave with the answers to those and other questions. 
And tonight, uh, we're fortunate to have as our speaker, Dr. Brian Helfan. He's head of urology at North Shore University Health System in Glenview, Illinois, just outside Chicago. And uh, Dr. Helfan, who prefers Brian, teaches at both the University of Chicago and Northwestern University here in the city. Uh, he received his medical degree and doctorate in molecular biology from Northwestern. And the molecular biologists, like Brian, are experts on genetic and genomic testing. Uh, I, I should disclose that uh, Brian has been uh, my personal uh, urologist for the past four years, and I, I've been on active surveillance for 10 years. And uh, it looks like I may finish the game uh, of life in active surveillance. And uh, Brian will make the presentation uh, followed by a question and answer by my fellow moderators, Joe Gallo, who you met already, and Elliot Terman. And uh, so Brian, it's the ball's in your court. Excellent. <clears throat> well, thank you guys uh, for inviting me and sir. Certainly, thank you to AMCAN and us too uh, for putting this all together. Um, as I previously said, I think this service, this community um, is well needed. And certainly the era of active surveillance is a undermet need in terms of support groups, because I believe there are many support groups for advanced cancer, um, but really there have been few that have addressed uh, the unmet need of supporting those with seemingly low risk prostate cancer. And I should also give a, a special shout out um, while uh, we're introducing ourselves uh, to Howard uh, Walensky, not only for organizing uh, this, uh, but it is also his birthday. Um, so when you get a chance, uh, make sure and uh, wish him uh, the best. Um, as we kind of move forward here, um, just my you know kind of brief uh, introduction is that I am a uh, practicing urologist who is focused in on prostate cancer. I have the unique um, pleasure, if you will, that I have been able to find a job um, or at least convince people um, that I um, really wanted to combine both my interests, not only in uh, prostate cancer and surgery, uh, but also with my background uh, in research um, in genomics and genetics. And so I never thought uh, that they would actually come together and marry, but certainly in the era of uh, personalized medicine, this has really come to the forefront and it's particularly been highlighted uh, in the ar arena of low-risk prostate cancer for active surveillance. And so if we can get this moving here. I think everyone uh, maybe who has been diagnosed with prostate cancer or who knows someone uh, with prostate cancer doesn't realize uh, that the amount of errors uh, that we see uh, throughout medicine, but particularly with diagnosing and screening for prostate cancer. There really are no absolute truths um, that exist in medicine or prostate cancer. And nonetheless, as, as a physician, I'm supposed to make decisions based on the overall picture even though I often don't know the truth. Um, and for, for those of you who have prostate cancer and who have undergone this process, you may be frightened to realize um, how much error we face on a daily basis. And when we use uh, PSA screening as an example uh, and look at the PSA test itself, it has been estimated that between 25 to 30% of those values can vary on a daily basis. So we're making decisions and looking patients um, and recommending things like prostate biopsies based on a PSA level that has that much variability. So that's kind of scary in itself. And then when we talk about prostate biopsies, and again, for those of you who have undergone them, it is not, or for some maybe, but it's not necessarily the most fun experience. And when you think about the errors associated with those, meaning that if we come up with a negative result, you don't have prostate cancer, about 30% of men may ultimately be diagnosed with prostate cancer throughout time because we miss the cancer. So there's an error in our gold standard for diagnosis. And when we finally diagnose prostate cancer, if you have a Gleason 6 cancer, as an example, about 30 to 40% of them in some studies may ultimately be found to have a more aggressive tumor that's hiding in there. 
And for those of you who are undergoing active surveillance, if you were diagnosed with a low risk prostate cancer, about 30 to 40 percent of those men will ultimately harbor more aggressive tumors over time. So again, all of these years, and we are making decisions to either treat or follow you. Um, so it's it's really quite unbelievable. And why do we have these? Um, we have these errors, and, and these errors have plagued urology and prostate cancer for a long time. And because of them, we ended up screening everyone at one point in time. And that has led to an overdiagnosis and overtreatment of many seemingly indolent, non aggressive type prostate tumors. And at the same time, we've actually underdiagnosed some men who've actually had aggressive tumors because we didn't find it. And by the time we recognized that it was too aggressive, those men had uh, metastatic or lethal cancer that spread outside their prostate. And this is just a reminder because I hear some background. If you uh, haven't muted your microphones, just mute them. And so when we look at a biopsy, why do we have errors? And again, this, this relates to many uh, aspects of prostate cancer. But for the vast majority of men who have prostate cancer, it's a multifocal tumor, meaning that prostate tumor, cancer, when it arises, it just doesn't form as one tumor, but rather multiple tumors throughout the prostate at one time. And it turns out that all the tumors that arise aren't cr created equally. Some have more aggressive potential and some have other less aggressive potential. And again, just to remind people, we judge, if you will, or rank how aggressive a, a tumor is and how uh, by the Gleason score. So a Gleason score of three is non-aggressive, Gleason four is intermediate and five is very aggressive. So if you have a tumor or a prostate that contains many multifocal tumors like this patient does here, and we put our bio biopsy needle in, we may actually miss a tumor if we don't hit the right spot. But if we are fortunate enough or lucky, I don't know what the word is, to find cancer in the uh, prostate itself, we may only hit a Gleason 3 spot or maybe a little Gleason 4, and we would ultimately grade that core as a Gleason 3 plus 4. But we may have actually missed the worst part of the prostate cancer, which is the Gleason 5 hiding in there. So again, it's one of those where um, we're kind of starting off behind the ball uh, because we don't have the most accurate way to fully screen or diagnose prostate cancer. And so why did active surveillance develop? Because the nice thing is, is that prostate cancer is a very slow growing disease for the most part. So we have a big lead time. We have the ability to say, hey, we can make some errors, but ultimately create a picture. And if we think you're low risk, we have time to actually figure out if you actually indeed are low risk, or if it ultimately will develop into a more aggressive type tumor. And so that's active surveillance is, hey, we will watch you set up that safety net underneath you so we can safely monitor you and seemingly for those who have seemingly low risk tumors. And by doing that, we will avoid any kind of over treatment and the possible side effects that may be associated with those, including incontinence or sexual dysfunction or uh, gastrointestinal issues, et cetera. So active surveillance is really um, now considered standard of care, but it was developed to say, hey, just because you have prostate cancer does not mean you need treatment. But many patients can actually be safely followed by the strategy. And again, we set up that safety net to make sure that you are not progressing or developing a higher grade or more aggressive type tumor there. And again, at North Shore, uh, we were one of the first established IRB approved protocols in the country. Since 2007, there's now over a thousand men who have enrolled in our formal IRB approved protocol, meaning that anyone who enrolls gets officially enrolled so we can follow you as a research protocol, even though it's considered standard of care. But that allows us to regularly analyze our data and say, hey, guys who are drinking similar water to you, what are risk factors for them progressing? And additionally, there's another 250 men that we follow off protocol. The average age of diagnosis has been about 63 years. The median PSA or average PSA in enrollment, uh, the time that they uh, were diagnosed was about five. Most men have been followed for just under six years. 
90% of our population has Gleason 6 low risk prostate cancer, and about 10% has Gleason 3 plus 4 lower volume, meaning it, it involves a smaller number of uh, snippets in the biopsy of type cancer. And about 27% of men uh, have been recategorized to a higher grade disease over time and or uh, need treatment uh, at that time. And so how do we, uh, at least at North Shore, but uh, throughout the country, I believe, how do we identify the ideal candidate uh, for active surveillance? And my personal belief, and, and I, I believe uh, a lot of people are at least coming to this conclusion as a total buzzkill, is that there is no single test, and I wish there was, there is no single test that can reliably identify patients that will develop more aggressive disease over time. So we can't just give you a PSA or a MRI and say, hey, if we do this, it'll replace a biopsy, or we don't ever have to follow you again because there is no risk that you will ever progress. Um, and that's a good thing and maybe a bad thing because that involves that we have to put together a story and think about it for a little bit. So in my opinion, it's an overall gestalt. What picture can I create for a patient that lets me know if they are doing well in active surveillance and they are safely being monitored, or if, hey, I have a higher suspicion that things are changing and the tumor is becoming, or, or a higher grade, more aggressive tumor has arisen. And so we use many different tests, many different modalities, if you will, to help us come to this conclusion. So everyone, I believe, is familiar with the blood serum uh, PSA test. This is just a, a test that we, if you have a value less than 10, you are more ideal than if you're greater than 10. If we use PSA density, that's the serum PSA value over the prostate volume size, and if that ratio comes out less than 0 0.15, that's more ideal. There are other blood tests, the PHI or prostate health index or 4K score that can be utilized uh, in this setting that gives us additional information. Men who have prostate tumors that are localized to the prostate or ideally are of a lower non-aggressive grade, at least in three plus three equals six. If they have few number of snippets, uh, biopsy samples that are positive with tumor, that's more favorable. Certainly, uh, MRI is a uh, utilized and even uh, progressing uh, area that we are trying to monitor. But again, in and of itself, it's not perfect. And so ideally, right now, if you have a negative MRI, that's certainly better than if you have a, a target uh, that we can see on, on that uh, imaging study. But what I'm really here to talk about, and certainly the passion of mine, is really within the field of genomics as well as genetics. And that's really what I would like to spend the rest of this talk uh, focusing in on, is how we can use genomics and genetics uh, to better identify the ideal candidate uh, for active surveillance. And these terms are really thrown around all of the time, uh, and they are very confusing. Most urologists, uh, just to make everyone feel better, have no idea what they're even talking about when we talk about what's the difference between a genomic and genetic test. And, and nonetheless is that we uh, use them all of the time to get information. So genomics, especially for the purposes of this talk, is a really broad term terminology. And it refers to an individual's complete DNA content and structure. And that's a, in itself kind of a mouthful. But that really just means that um, it includes, it's a relatively broad spectrum or study that looks at the DNA sequence. So remember, um, back to biology, and we'll show you again in the, uh, the next slide, is that DNA is that kind of junk, uh, the cell blueprints that sits in every cell that you have that tells the cell what to do and uh, provides the overall structure uh, instructions uh, to the cell. Ultimately, that is uh, looked at and then uh, turned into RNA. And RNA are considered kind of the building blocks. So they're the next part of, hey, this is what I was told to do. So we'll put some building blocks there. And those ultimately will be turned into a house um, known as proteins, which end up being the functional structure in cells. 
And genomics really refers to that process going from DNA to proteins and all of the things that can happen at that, uh, to each one of those uh, steps. Um, and it, it's really the study of that process going in there. Versus if for the terms of this talk, genetics, I'm really referring to the specific study of the cell blueprints, that sequence, the individual codes that leads to who you are and what happens in tumor, but specifically to the DNA. So that's really the difference here is that genetics is really just a subset of genomics but genomics is probably the most common terminology that we use. But again, it's just a broad term that is referred to anything that potentially can happen from DNA on uh, versus genetics is really just the DNA uh, subtype. So again, just to show a picture of this is that DNA, again, is just the blueprints. Ultimately, it's turned into RNA, which is really the building blocks, which then make the proteins you have uh, many different types of proteins that ultimately uh, form the cell and tell it what to do, or, or the kind of uh, make up the, the action part of the cell. Versus DNA, which is just the blueprints here, and that's the stuff that's passed from generation to generation. Now, just to clarify things, is that when we talk about genetics, there are really kind of two fields of genetics, if you will. There are what's called germline mutations or germline genetics. And that's really the stuff that makes me me and Howard him. Um, and so ultimately speaking is, is that um, this is the stuff that we inherit from our parents. Um, you get 50% from your father and 50% from your mother and it's present in the egg and the sperm. Uh, they join together and they form us and it can be inherited. So if you ultimately have a mutation, meaning my father had a a mutation in a specific DNA sequence that encodes a gene that ultimately um, he formed prostate cancer and then he passed along that same mutation uh, to myself, I will have that gene and have increased risk of developing prostate cancer. These type of mutations are present in every cell throughout the body and it's a cause of cancer familial syndromes. So these are why we have relationships between prostate and breast and ovarian um, and pancreatic cancers, et cetera, because they often have mutations that in the family can have um, different types of uh, manifestations. Again, every cell in the body, if you have that type of mutation, will have altered DNA, which then leads to altered uh, RNA structures and alt altered protein structures. Versus if we talk about somatic tumor mutations, these are pro things that can accumulate over time, meaning that they are not inherited. So my parents did not pass them around, but uh, they, these mutations or variations accumulate because of exposures that we have. And I think the classic example is if we go in, we sit in the sun or we're exposed to chemicals, our skin will pick up uh, toxins and that toxins can turn our machinery um, and create uh, issues there or mutations that ultimately lead to mutations in the skin and can cause or propagate tumors. And so only those cells uh, that have those alterations, as an example, in your skin or your prostate, will have those mutations. Those lead to altered DNA specifically within the skin or the prostate or whatever we're referring to, which lead to altered RNA and altered protein. And so it depends where we're looking or what we're talking about if we're talking about genetics, um, period. But again, this is really confusing, and I think I probably have put most of you already to sleep. And I always feel like I was the only one who was staying awake in science class and everyone used to make fun of me and it was boring. Um, on the other hand is, uh, to keep it really simple is, these days when we're talking about genomic tests and we're talking specifically about prostate cancer, most of the time we're really looking at an RNA protein-based signature. So this is looking at the, the building blocks in the, in the uh, cell and specifically looking to say, hey, in that tumor, are there expression or is there biology saying, hey, the proteins are a little higher or lower that are associated with an aggressive type tumor um, compared to those with a non-aggressive tumor? When we're talking about genetic tests, we're st we can still talk about the DNA, but it's really talking about uh, the germline, so in any cell, 
or we can talk about the tumor somatic DNA, which is specifically in cancer cells. Again, the difference here, just to keep it simple, is that the genomic tests are really generalized, focused in on RNA or protein expression, and the genetic tests are really talking about DNA. And so how can we use these to better explain or better predict who is a good candidate for active surveillance? Well, it turns out that what we're really looking for are signatures that are really more predictive of those who have true aggressive cancer. And I think most urologists, most radiation oncologists and medical oncologists would agree that certainly once you get to an unfavorable intermediate risk, which we call a Gleason four plus three equals seven type cancer, so it is more aggressive, or have worse or more aggressive pathology, that that's a, that is a definite time where we say, hey, you probably, if you have more than 10 years left, um, need treatment. And the versus those who have a low risk, Gleason 6 or kind of 3 plus 4 low volume type tumor. Because if you look at overall the outcomes of those type of patients, those who have a Gleason 6 or uh, low volume Gleason 3 plus 4 type tumor do far better in terms of survival, in terms of if, if you treat it, that it'll come back in terms of metastasis or death from prostate cancer versus those who have a, a more aggressive 7, 8, 9, uh, or 10 type tumor. And so if that's the key, can, are there tests out there that can help identify the biology that may be more associated with aggressive tumors. And certainly there are now genomic, these are all commercially available tests, um, that have been uh, developed specifically to help us uh, understand that biology which can predict or better predict those type of outcomes. And so the uh, Prolaris, the Decipher, and the Oncotype DX are all commercially available tests that are uh, available, um, that can be run off a biopsy. Um, so when you get diagnosed with prostate cancer or you've been uh, undergoing serial evaluations, any of these tests uh, can be ordered. You need a minimum of one millimeter of tissue, of cancer tissue in your biopsy sample to run these tests. Um, and I'm going to go through each one of these tests uh, with, with some detail. Um, just to kind of explain how they work and what their outcome is. My personal, um, or I should say, is, is honestly speaking, I don't have a bias for any of these, and it's my job to just uh, explain to you what these are and how we utilize them. And so Oncotype DX is a genomic test, again, an RNA-based test, that really looks at the expression, it's an RNA-based expression of 17 genes that are related to different pathways. Um, and based on the expression, so based on the biology of these, whether they're higher or lower, they can calculate what's called a genomic prostate score or GPS. This GPS uh, value, which again is just a numeric value that's assigned based on the expression levels of these proteins, can predict prostate cancer progression specifically in the active surveillance population. So it can predict the chances in a 10-year period of you being diagnosed with a four plus three uh, or higher type cancer or more aggressive type um, tumor within your prostate. And again, these are especially designed uh, for those who are currently undergoing active surveillance to help make decisions uh, more uh, accurately. And again, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with this test, this again looked at different um, uh, different response pathways. So most of you are familiar with testosterone and its uh, association with prostate cancer. So it looks at androgen or testosterone signaling. It looks at proliferation, how fast are cells dividing, how cells are organized, um, and also the uh, kind of surrounding uh, dish, uh, response. And it looks at proteins within these pathways so it is multimodal uh, because it's not just focused on one of those. And based on the signature, as I said, is it can predict a or calculate a genomic prostate score. And again, historically, when we classified patients, we can, using the National Cancer Comprehensive uh, Network guidelines, we can categorize patients into very low risk, low risk, or intermediate risk. Of course, everyone wants to be at very low risk. 
Um, but unfortunately, uh, biology always wins. And so we accept that. Uh, but not every low risk or very low risk or intermediate risk prostate tumor is built the same. So if we look at the biology that underlies or that's associated with different patients that are all categorized using the same clinical variables into one of these three groups, we can see that there's variation. And as an example, if we look specifically at the low risk uh, group, you will see that there's a spectrum of biology that underlies it. And again, if you have a GPS score that is elevated or high, that means that your tumor is more aggressive and so based on their outcomes, they would suggest that you may not be the best candidate for active surveillance. On the other hand is I feel really good when I'm considering a low risk patient for, pro, uh, for active surveillance and indeed their biology comes back that is consistent with low risk. Those people obviously probably don't need treatment and all the information is concordant and, and is used to help counsel patients. When we look at other uh, studies of this, and there have been uh, many studies now looking at the Oncotype DX assay, but it is an independent prediction, predictor of uh, being upgraded or recategorized in active surveillance, meaning that if you start off with Gleason 6, there is an increased probability that you may be uh, diagnosed with Gleason 7 if you have a higher uh, GPS score. Again, if you compare it to other variables here, PSA density, number of cores positive, those are also independent predictors um, that can be added to the story uh, and utilized. For those of you who aren't familiar, this is just a copy of the uh, Oncotype DX report. As an example, if a patient is categorized here as a low risk prostate cancer, but they come in and their biology indicates that it's actually intermediate or higher risk, that patient again would support that may Maybe their biology is more aggressive and they should have a caution about continuing with active surveillance. And this will actually even put a uh, numeric value on it, saying that based on this, as an example, biology, that about there's a 49% chance that this particular patient would have a higher grade Gleason 7 or advanced uh, stage cancer in the next 10 years if we continue to follow on active surveillance. On the other hand is uh, patients have a 50% chance that they may do well, but at least that's a discussion point to have with the patient. Moving on, another gene genomic test that's uh, been popularized is a Prolaris test. Again, this is an RNA-based test that really looks at cell cycle progression. Again, cell cycle progression tells us how fast these cells may be dividing, um, and those cells that are dividing faster may be more aggressive. This looks at 31 cell cycle progression genes, um, and they can calculate a CCP or cell cycle progression score. Those who have higher scores may, again, not be the best candidates for active surveillance. Again, this is just a list of the uh, genes that are used. Again, this is all focused in on one pathway. This pathway is really uh, dedicated to cell cycle turnover and progression. And again, the thought there is, is that uh, cancer cells uh, behave more aggressively, they divide more frequently, and if you can look at those genes and they're elevated among those prostate tumors that are uh, dividing more frequently, those may not be the ones that are appropriate candidates for active surveillance. And again, in a similar fashion, if we use standard clinical fashion, we can uh, divide patients into low, intermediate, high-risk type prostate tumors. And again, um, everyone with clinical low risk tumors would have the same probability of failing over time. But if you use a Prolaris test and calculate a CCP, again, within every category, you will see that there's a wide range of RNA-based bio biologic signatures within this. And those who have higher uh, CCP scores, their cells are dividing faster, may actually not be good candidates for active surveillance. And as such, again, this is a discussion point to uh, have and talk about with your patients. Again, the end point that we usually talk about here is what are the risks of metastasis or dying of prostate cancer? Um, so they don't quote the, the risk of adverse pathology. Um, so sometimes, uh, again, um, we just have to remind patients that this is, you know, if we follow you, um, these are the increased probability that uh, the cancer can spread or do bad things. 
Finally, and by no means least, uh, Decipher uh, has developed a biopsy assay. Again, this is another genomic RNA-based test that looks at uh, 22 genes, again, within multiple different pathways. Um, it predicts prostate cancer upgrading or recategorization in the active uh, surveillance population. And again, it's used as a decision aid um, to help patients better decide if you're an appropriate candidate for active surveillance or not. Many studies now uh, have been done in the active surveillance population with the cipher, as well as other um, aspects of prostate cancer stages. Um, but if we specifically look at active surveillance, the Decipher score itself um, has a, is very high performing. And again, when we consider it or compare it to the standard clinical variables, which as a urologist, we gather all the time, your Gleason score, your PSA, your age, et cetera, that ultimately the Decipher remains independent and a better predictor um, than using standard categories. And again, any type of these RNA signatures, or at least the decipher, has been shown that it is not associated by your, is not uh, impacted by the Gleason score in itself. And certainly it does not change um, related to prostatitis, BPH, sexual activity, physical activity, other things that can confound uh, PSA and, and other uh, things that we, or tools that we normally use. For those of you who are not familiar with the Decipher report, it basically compares your uh, Decipher score um, compared to other men uh, with similar type of pathology and says, are you lower risk, average risk, or higher risk? Um, it gives you an actual score, so 0 0.26, meaning that you're in the bottom 26%. Uh, um, and based on that, um, it does predict what are the risk of you developing a high grade Gleason 7 or higher. Um, over a 10-year period, the risk uh, of developing with treatment if you were treated at that stage of uh, developing metastasis um, and or going on to die from prostate cancer. Again, it's a report, it's a frame of reference to help guide patients make a more accurate uh, decision at the time of diagnosis or certainly surveillance um, when considering active surveillance. And so, uh, again, the conclusions here for our, the genomic tests, um, again, we have pros, uh, Prolaris, Decipher, and Oncotype DX, um, that they are widely used um, in the setting. Um, I think, again, their intention is to uh, use them as a decision-making tool to better understand um, the biology of what's going on in the cells. Can we use the biology, the RNA signature, to help us understand which uh, men actually harbor more aggressive type tumors that may not do well on active surveillance. It's independent of other tests and clinical variables. As I said, is our standard categorization. Um, it is not influenced by that. Um, and so certainly, again, this is biology, the RNA that's giving us additional information. Again, part of the personalized medicine effort. But I do hold caution and my personal belief and disclosure is um, is that this should not be used as a sole decision-making tool. Um, and I'm going to repeat that because I've seen it so many times. But a genomic-based um, test or even a genetic-based test for the most part should not be used as a sole decision-making tool. Again, I believe that there is no one test that is going to tell you if you um, are going to do well or not in active surveillance. So it, I believe in the Gestalt method. Um, and again, it's a piece of data that we have that adds to the pile that we say, hey, does this make sense or not? Um, and I think um, I have seen it, and I do put some caution there that uh, there are a lot of uh, physicians out there, and it's not incorrect uh, to some degree but they will make uh, decisions because they believe so much in the, these biology, these uh, personalized tests um, that you need treatment based on that. And again, I put some caution there uh, because I, I do think that it, it adds, it's a piece of data that adds to the picture that should be combined with everything. I'm gonna now move on uh, to uh, genetics. And again, we're gonna start with the germline genetics. And this has really come in uh, to the scene lately because there's a lot of evidence that people who harbor or men who harbor specific mutations um, in their DNA, and again, this is the DNA that's passed from generation to generation, 
um, have, and these are men with advanced prostate cancer, but they may have a response to uh, specific therapies that have made the news recently. So these are things like PARP inhibitors or platinum-based or immunotherapies. And that's not what I'm going to talk about today, but rather talk about how these same type of mutations can be used to identify men who may be good candidates for active surveillance. And so why should we test your genetics when you're diagnosed with prostate cancer? And again, this is part of the personalized medicine effort, but it is becoming increasingly evident that we should have probably been doing this for a while. Uh, in breast cancer, uh, for many types of breast cancer and, and family histories, this has been standard. But in prostate, as guys, we're probably a little slow sometimes to come into the field, but it is becoming increasingly evident um, that genetic testing uh, and assessment has utility. And uh, understanding our genetics can really help us uh, at the time of diagnosis, because if you have certain mutations that predispose to prostate cancer and specifically even highly aggressive prostate cancer, you may want to offer them earlier screening or more frequent screening based on those mutations. What is relevant uh, to men on active surveillance is a lot of those mutations uh, have implications for aggressiveness. So if you have a mutation that's going to uh, increase the risk of you having aggressive prostate cancer, then again, you may not consider active surveillance because there's such a high probability that you will fail it at the time that, and develop an aggressive type tumor. And again, as I just said, is that um, these mutation or knowledge of these mutations has a lot of implications uh, for men who have advanced prostate cancer because it has a lot of prognostic information of, about your response to certain uh, chemotherapies and medication. And as I tell my patients is forget you, we also have your family to consider. Um, and so if you have a mutation, then your relatives should also consider genetic testing because if they inherited those mutations, and again, it's, it's passed from generation to generation. So if your family member has that uh, mutation, then they uh, would benefit from it because they may be screened earlier or more frequently for prostate cancer and or other tumors that mutation may uh, predispose to. And again, why do we care about this in active surveillance? And again, it's a reasonable assumption that if a genetic mutation is associated with increased risk of aggressive prostate cancer, then again, treatment strategies, including active surveillance or watchful waiting, should be uh, avoided. Um, and if you have these mutations, then definitive treatment or earlier treatment, I should say, with surgery or radiation should be more strongly considered. And there should be some caution uh, with the use of focal therapies that may be more experimental uh, at this time, especially in light of the fact that that mutation gives rise uh, to more aggressive tumors and also often multifocal aggressive tumors. And so is there evidence there that really support this? And again, I'm gonna show research uh, from our group, um, but there are uh, many, many other studies uh, that have supported this throughout time. And one of the more recent studies that we've done in collaboration with Johns Hopkins um, is that we looked at about 1,700 men who underwent uh, radical surgery at uh, Johns Hopkins. Um, about half of the patients ultimately at that time of surgery um, had really aggressive cancer. Um, so they had, you know, kind of Gleason 8, 9, and 10 cancer. And uh, we compared those to about 1,000 men uh, who had low-grade cancer. Remember, at the time, um, when a lot of these samples were collected, we were really treating all men now inappropriately uh, with, uh, who had prostate cancer. So we had about 1,000 of those. And all of these uh, men had blood samples, and they were ultimately sequenced uh, for a panel of 14 genes that have been associated with prostate cancer. And again, uh, these include the BRCA1 and BRCA2, so the BRCA1 and BRCA2 that we hear about in the news all the time. They've been historically associated with breast and ovarian cancer. Angelina Jolie has the BRCA2 mutation. Uh, but these are um, genes that ultimately um, we look for in prostate cancer as well. And we saw it after sequencing these uh, sample, these patient samples, if um, 
if, if men who had more aggressive disease had a higher risk of having these mutations. And that's certainly what we found is that men who had uh, mutations and specifically within three genes known as ATM, the BRCA2 and a gene called MSH2, you don't have to remember these names offhand, but these mutations are kind of bad players, bad actors. And so not only were they higher frequency in men who had aggressive tumors, um, but they were even among aggressive tumors, they were the worst. They gave rise to the Gleason 9 and 10 cancers, even compared to the eight uh, type cancers. And if you specifically looked at ATM alone, there's almost a six-fold higher risk of you having Gleason 10 cancer, the worst that we know of, suggesting that these mutations, and again, which are passed from generation to generation, give rise to really bad, um, bad actors, bad players. And so again, if you have one of these mutations, you may not be the best candidate for active surveillance. Further support of this is that, uh, and these were some of the initial um, studies performed, is that there were large sequencing studies that looked at men who had metastatic and lethal cancer. And again, they looked at a panel of what are called DNA damage repair genes, or uh, DDR uh, mutations. And again, these include the um, BRCA1 and BRCA2 uh, mutations. And it turns out that men who have advanced prostate cancer, about 8 to 12% of them, will have these uh, bad you know, kind of mutations that they were born with. So again, suggesting that this is more common than we think, but if you have a mutation uh, that predisposes to more aggressive you know, cancer, higher Gleason score, and it, it does uh, equate to higher frequency of having metastatic or lethal cancer, do we want to follow you? And again, here's just one other study that I should have said that uh, we performed again in collaboration with Johns Hopkins, um, that if you have one of these type of mutations, you um, not only are more likely to develop lethal cancer, but you ultimately are usually diagnosed with and ultimately die from cancer um, at a younger age compared to those without the mutation. So how do these mutations uh, function or uh, perform in active surveillance? Because ideally, you're so low risk, no one should have these mutations. But it turns out that's not true. Um, unfortunately, um, there are men uh, who are enrolled in active surveillance, not even really understanding or realizing that uh, they may have these mutations. And so when we looked at two independent cohorts of prostate cancer who were actively undergoing active surveillance, either at Norris or at Johns Hopkins, all of these men had Gleason 6 at enrollment. Again, no big deal. They all have low risk prostate cancer. And we just looked at those who were reclassified, who had a higher Gleason score over time. All of these men were sequenced uh, for certain genes, ATM, BRCA1, and BRCA2. And we just looked at how many of those uh, over time were reclassified. And again, not unexpectedly, um, there was a, a significantly higher risk of being reclassified um, to higher grade disease over time. And specifically, when we looked at going from a Gleason 6 to that 4 plus 3 more aggressive type tumor, there was a much higher rate. And so men with these mutations had between a two and a half to a five fold higher rate of failing, if you will, or active surveillance or being recategorized over time. And it does not mean that they developed metastasis or certainly went on to die from prostate cancer. It just meant that their, their survival, if you will, in active surveillance or time that was being followed was a lot shorter um, than men without these mutations. So again, if we're going to summarize what the germline mutations are, if you have a BRCA2 or ATM mutation, um, really, there's strong consideration against active surveillance. This is not necessarily widespread acceptance, but certainly it's become our protocol to have that conversation with patients to say, hey, there is a very high probability that you're going to develop a, uh, a bad tumor, and it generally goes from zero to 60 very quickly. You may not be the best candidate. Again, there's a question mark, but if you're a BRCA1, check 2 or MSH2 mutation carrier, then again, um, maybe we should talk about it. But many of the other mutations that we look for may not impact whether you do well or not. Um, and so it's considered safe, if you will, to consider uh, continue active surveillance. What's the future here? 
Um, can we use true genetics in our tumor tissue um, to look for outcomes? Again, this is now novel. This is not commercially available. This is stuff that we believe is on the forefront. And again, this is not looking at germline genetics. This is taking one millimeter tissue from your sample, but instead of looking at RNA, we would look at DNA. And again, does this have prognostic value? So again, we're not using genetics in this sense to look at response to medications. We're really looking at it as a predictive ability to can we identify men who may not be good candidates for active surveillance. And so our research group years ago um, decided to look at uh, different genetics uh, or variations within our tumor samples. And ultimately, what we found is that a lot of these men didn't have true mutations, but we normally have two copies of any given gene. But sometimes in tumors, we end up having three, four, five, six, seven copies of specifically of certain uh, genes associated with cancer, or sometimes we actually get rid of one or two, um, so we only have one or no copies of a specific gene. And we call those gains or deletions. And uh, while that sounds uh, very confusing, what we're really looking at what is called copy number variations or CNVs, which can have been associated with, you know, kind of various cancers and aggressive cancers. And if we look at those men who have developed metastasis, it's really gains and deletions in other genes, P53, P10, uh, et cetera, um, that uh, have been associated with more metastasis. And the interesting thing is if we look at these copy number variations, they are, they number one, they form early in tumor genesis. So when a prostate tumor develops, these not copy number variations um, uh, seem to occur very early on. And those are the ones that typically are, like to leave the prostate or metastasize outside. So then the question said is, can we use this if we know that these copy number variations have been associated with increased aggressive potential, can we use these to predict who is going to do well or not well in active surveillance? So we recently, again, um, isolated DNA from one millimeter of tissue, just like you would in an RNA-based test, and looked at men who had really bad lethal cancer, those who had uh, were treated and had uh, recurrence, and specifically, um, you know, kind of men who were uh, on active surveillance, um, doing well or not doing well. And what we ultimately concluded was that um, the more of these copy number alterations or variations that patients had, the worse they were. And it turns out uh, that there's a dose response trend. So the worst um, players, you know, were the, the guys who had really bad cancer and they had a lot of copy number variations. The men act, go, undergoing active surveillance generally um, didn't have that many copy number variations. But if you look specifically at those who progressed in active surveillance, it actually performed the best. So copy number variations within the tumor, so increases or decreases in the, in the number of specific uh, uh, genes, that actually was very predictive of who was going to be recategorized or progress in active surveillance. So again, this is something that is not co uh, currently available that we're um, working on, but I believe that this is kind of um, hot off the presses, if you will, of using um, tumor DNA to better predict who is going to be a good candidate for active surveillance. So in summary here, um, there's really currently no single test, no single test that reliably predicts who is going to do well and who is going to fail or be recategorized in active surveillance. But really, multiple tests and the gestalt we get from looking at a whole picture that includes PSA, MRI, all their tests, but certainly includes biomarkers is needed to help establish that picture. And again, my advocacy is that biomarkers in the form of RNA-based genomic tests, Oncotype, Polaris, or Decipher, and DNA-based tests should be utilized to be better help us understand who is going to fail or not fail active surveillance.
And again, future tests identify men who most likely harbor aggressive disease are on the horizon, uh, and they uh, do include a lot of these somatic DNA tests. So with that, um, I always like to thank our team, and this is just a small proportion of our team um, who is always working away, and I can guarantee half of them are in the lab right now, uh, isolating DNA and analyzing it as we speak. Um, but they are really uh, the people who work relentlessly behind the scenes uh, who can provide us data to help uh, translate that into our patient care. And so we're always so grateful of them. And again, uh, thank you guys uh, for the invitation to speak today. And with that, I'm very happy um, to answer questions. Uh, Brian, we're gonna, we're gonna hand this to uh, Howard for a moment. Okay. Well, thank you, Brian. Uh, there's thunderous applause. You just can't hear it. Okay. <laughs> At any rate, uh, before we move into questions, um, there's going to be a quick poll of the audience. I think two questions. And so I think Joe, Joe is going to put up the poll. Okay, well, okay. I'm going to I'm going to I'll be, uh, show you the results. Right. So it's 70 79% of our audience participated in that. That's excellent. Thank you very much. But it's interesting as much as we hear about these genetic tests 63% uh, and I'm assuming that most are, are men on active surveillance, 63% um, have never uh, had a test. So, you know, Brian, do you have a re reaction to that? And I, I assume you can see, you know, which tests are favored with Oncotype being the most common and then Decipher and then Polaris. So, you know, why so few and, uh, you know, does it, are you surprised with which ones are being used? No, I, I mean, I, I am not surprised at all. Um, and I think um, there's some fluctuations um, and a lot of this is, you know, somewhat related to urologists. Um, I think there are two things that we've kind of witnessed throughout the years is that number one there was a huge uptake initially um and then there was kind of a burnout because um you know uh urologists and patients kind of got overwhelmed by a lot of the uh tests and the other thing is um and, and this is how when i speak to other urologists my impression is a lot of them are still intimidated somewhat um, by genomic tests because they don't truly understand uh, what is being offered or how to incorporate it. And that's, you know, some of the problem there is that, you know, a lot of page, or clinicians made decisions maybe historically uh, based on these results alone and were sometimes disappointed, uh, but I, I don't think that's how they were designed to use so uh, be used. So I think that there's an educational piece that's missing, um, both on the clinician front, uh, but also an awareness front on the uh, patients um, that these exist and, and how they can be used. And you, you mentioned, you know, just as you were finishing, uh, something about, you know, this is one of these tests is, or these tests are part of a gestalt. So you're gonna look at, the density and the and the MRI and so on. Um, but are you suggesting that the men go through a series of these tests? 
Well, I think it's a whole picture. And, and I think that if you're truly undergoing active surveillance, again, in my opinion, that a PSA test every once in a while and a biopsy may not suffice to call that active surveillance. And the problem is, is that there's not a uniform or universal protocol that is recommended um, for all patients. So if you look at the practice patterns of urologists throughout this country, there's number one going to be a variability on how the acceptance of surveillance, but two, the type of tests or what they call active surveillance is also different. And I, again, my personal bias is maybe I'm just not a smart man, uh, but on the other hand is I do believe that more information um, is sometimes beneficial and the more we can actually put together to create a story to say, does this make sense? It helps us all get on the same page. And again, it's a lot easier to talk to patients when we have multiple pieces of data to kind of make that decision off of. That historic, go ahead. Yeah, let me ask you, I mean, is it realistic? I mean, these tests are very expensive, right? What is the, what is the price range? So again, it, it depends on your insurance coverage. Uh, a lot of times with the patient, it's nothing, but again, we have to look at the healthcare system. And again, you are correct, is when we start adding the cost of the MRI, when we talk blood tests, when we talk about genomic tests, et cetera, it ends up being thousands of dollars, thousands of dollars. Um, and again, it is one of those where it often can sound very expensive. My personal stance is, it's certainly a lot cheaper um, than any type of chemotherapy for metastatic cancer, not that those aren't needed, but the relative cost is decreased. And I'm not saying to utilize these haphazardly, but I think, again, it's a picture that we have to create. And so, you know, it may, when you add on everything, it could be, you know, $10,000 when all of these tests are included. So that is significant. Well, it, you know, so... The average person in the audience, and I'll, I'll use the word he because this is a he question in terms of the prostate. Um, you know, what, what, what should he be discussing with his, his personal physician about these uh, genetic genomic tests? You know, I mean, should he? change doctors if his doctor doesn't have a clue about this? How important is this really? You know, I, I have to admit my bias uh, because I, at the end of the day, am a firm believer in biology. Um, I think that understanding the biology of a tumor is of significant importance. Um, and so would I suggest leaving a urologist? No, if you have a great relationship with your urologist, and uh, the decisions that you're making you are comfortable with because I think that having a relationship and being comfortable with urologist is uh, very, very important. You, you shouldn't leave. But I certainly think that you should ask about their stance on the utility and what tests that they're going to incorporate, whether it's genomic, whether it's just blood-based or MRI, what other tests are we gonna use to get this information to help you make the best decision you can it is truly a collaborative effort between the urologist and the patient. Again, I hate when patients, this is uh, gonna surprise everyone. I hate when patients come in and they just start, look at me kind of blinded, like I have no question, I have no interest, I totally trust you. This is not 1960s medicine anymore. Um, I really look uh, to collaborate with the patient. Howard, I, I could add a little bit to that as well. If you uh, are under Medicare, the tests are covered, so that Correct. takes an awful lot off your yeah, back. Yeah, does, does Medicare provide a carte blanche to undergo you know, a series of these tests, different ones, at four to $6,000 a crack? I mean... I've, I've, I've had both the Oncotype DX and the Prolaris. And, I, okay. I and Howard, I had the Prolaris and that was covered. I have private insurance and that was covered by my private insurance. But Dr. Helfand, I had a very specific question about, you know, how do you decide between which which of those genomic tests like Prolaris, Oncotype DX or Decipher? And do people typically have more than one? And do, would you space it over time or do them right away? Or how would you, you know? 
Uh, my practice is very mixed and I often have patients who will be diagnosed and then are referred in the system and they've already had some genomic testing. So in that sense, I don't necessarily reorder a test. Um, I, um, because I do a lot of research uh, in it and uh, beca because I, I've been kind of uh, involved um, with it over time, I generally have t limited myself um, to just a few of those tests. So specifically in our program, we really focus in on the oncotype and the decipher. Um, and it's nothing against Polaris. It's just that at some point we just had to, in order to study it systematically to validate its utility, at least in our population, we had to, we couldn't use everything. Um, so that's just my personal preference. And do people generally have more than one or just one, or does it help to have more than one? Uh, it, sometimes it can make it more confusing uh, because a lot of times the patients have had more than one. If they're not concordant, it, it you know kind of adds to the picture. But again, that's really um, understanding what the differences between the tests can kind of uh, highlight that. And that sometimes when you have a multi-pathway, you're looking at different pathways, your potential for discordance may be, may be less. In my in my case, the the two tests, each one was done after a different biopsy, and then they were used for comparative purposes. Mm. Before before yeah, we gonna... jump too far ahead, let, let me let me pop up the other poll because that'll help generate some of this this dialogue that we're talking about. Okay. Sounds good. You're the boss. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Wow. And this is what this is with about 80% of the audience participating. I am very, very pleasantly surprised. Very pleasantly surprised. Historically, uh, we were uh, batting about 1%. Um, and in recent years, we've seen an increase. So um, kudos to, to the, uh, the patients on this um, conference, as well as their uh, urologists or, or whoever ordered it. That is um, excellent, especially because as it stands right now in guidelines, unless you have a strong family history, meaning three or more relatives with prostate cancer or uh, relatives with um, uh, breast, ovarian, some of the other related cancers, many of the men on this uh, call who are undergoing active surveillance technically don't qualify for genetic testing. Now, the cost of genetic testing have decreased substantially. So for most genetic testing, if you paid out of pocket, it's usually under $200 or around $200 for it. So it's not a horribly expensive test these days. Um, but I'm very happy to see the 30%. Um, we, I would love to increase that even further. Um, at some point, I would also love to pull, um, you know, how many men were tested for things other than BRCA1 and 2. Um, but that's a that's a different uh, question. Well, Joe, do you want to add that? I, I, well, I, I, don't, I don't have time to put it all together, so we'll have to invite Brian back, that's all. Okay. Do you think that it's, I mean, do you, does that leads me to, to ask this. Do you think that it's important for all, all of us to get uh, genetic tested and also more than just like is 23andMe enough like the BRCA2 or whatever or do we need the color extended or is that and is that what you would recommend where it's all of those genes? Right so the, so there's um, and it's a discussion of a whole nother talk but uh, you know there are many different genes um, that are implicated in prostate cancer um, with different insects. So there's a panel of genes that are associated with increased risk of developing prostate cancer, those who form 
uh, more aggressive cancer and those mutations that are going to be indicative of response to medications. And so where you are in that process can help dictate what type of panel you need. Um, most of the time, we do recommend getting a commercial grade true sequencing, meaning they get the whole sequence from start to finish of a given gene. Uh, 23andMe is often just a snippet of little tiny variations that are common uh, associated with uh, a lot of these genes. So it's not a complete sequencing and usually it's not in and itself suffice. Um, but uh, there are other, uh, again, so many different commercially available companies um, ranging you know, from Ambry to GoPath to Myriad who can offer that type of testing these days. I'd like to step in. Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, one, one of the people in the audience said that uh, given that you began by saying a biopsy could miss cancer cells, doesn't that mean an initial biopsy may not be useful in genetic or genomic analysis? Uh, we don't entirely know that answer. Um, there are certain protein signatures um, that are commercially available um, that you know can predict if we missed a cancer and that it's still there because there are certain changes that still uh, go on. Um, we don't know as of yet if uh, the DNA signature, the sequence or mutations uh, can be detected in that setting. Certainly methylation changes, so that's another thing that can happen to DNA. It's just another processing of that uh, blueprint um, can also somewhat predict um, whether there's cancer or not there. So um, there's a question mark there, uh, but certainly th th that possibility is, is there. Uh, and certainly there is our commercial available tests in that setting for that purpose. Now, a couple of people have been asking about, I think, uh, basically asking about liquid biopsies. Somebody says, is there a urine sample available instead of a biopsy sample? So what is the status of, of these uh, liquid biopsies? Uh, is this a lot of talk or is this available? And where well, does it fit in? Um, we don't know yet. Uh, certainly, there are there is work ongoing um, of looking at either DNA cells um, or kind of combination of both that are contained within the urine or even blood for that matter. Um, again, it can give us a idea if there is cancer there. So again, another piece of data that may ultimately um, aid in that decision making. A lot of these tests actually even uh, claim um, and have shown uh, in fairness that they are better at predicting higher grade, more aggressive cancer. So again, um, will they replace a biopsy? I don't think so at this point. Point um, because of the fact that usually we want to know if you are high grade, is it a Gleason 3 plus 4? Is it a 4 plus 3? But it certainly can lower or raise the bar and tell us, hey, what is the overall suspicion of you having cancer? So I think that they ultimately will be incorporated as another piece of data. Um, I don't, as of yet, foresee that they're going to totally replace biopsies, although. I certainly, um, although my patients all seem to love them, uh, welcome the day where we don't have to do biopsies. Oh yeah, they do love them. <laughs> Not, but, you know. Let, now we hit. Yeah, well, don't threaten me with the biopsy, please. Uh, on my special day, but okay. In ter in terms of. Um, Okay, somebody, a couple of people also have asked this in varying ways. Um, you know, if somebody had, you know, has been on active surveillance for, I don't know, seven, 10, 15 years, and they never had a test, a genetic or genomic test, is there any reason that they should have one now? So again, the purpose of it is to gather as much information. Um, and so it depends within active surveillance where you are. If you're deciding you need to have another biopsy or you don't need a biopsy um, because you've been doing so well and all of your other things are you know, pointing the direction that you're continuing to be successful, 
you probably don't need to measure it. Um, on the other hand is, if there's a question of saying, hey, I'm not doing as well, I'm trying to avoid another biopsy, I'm, it, it, as I say, is kind of reaching for straws, it's not unreasonable to get another piece of data based on the information you already had to say, hey, does this make sense? Did you have a more aggressive tumor based on the biology in there? And as, if so, you know, should we, um, you know, convince a patient to get another biopsy based on that. It can be used in that purpose, although not necessarily why we, we typically do it. And I always say is if you're going to have a biopsy, don't do it on the old tissue, wait until you have to re-biopsy. And if you find cancer there, you can, you know, run it again. I had a question from the audience that I thought was interesting, which was that, you know how in the beginning you were showing us the picture of the prostate and there were different and there were different maybe tumors in different parts of the prostate if you know if let's say you're diagnosed with grade uh, two three plus four and they use th that tissue to send to do the genomic test that's the only thing that's going to be if let's say it's the decipher test or the oncotype dx that's the only thing that's going to be analyzed if there was a more aggressive cancer somewhere else that was missed that wouldn't be covered is that right? That is that is 100% correct. So these do not necessarily pick up, or we have it hasn't been reliably shown that they pick up a what's called a field defect, meaning that the whole prostate is has that same uh, genomic signature, um, and so it doesn't make a difference what we choose. They typically will pick the highest volume or highest grade tumor to perform it making the assumption that it's all um, bad. Now, having said that is, um, and I'll look at Oncotype or Decipher, is some of the ways that they were picked the genes is that when they looked at the pathway, they found a common pathway that was associated with aggressive between those with low risk and those with higher risk cancers in the specimen. So they um, have potentially, although never shown, never shown, are picking up a global tumor, uh, aberrancy, or, or a signature that may be associated with uh, aggressive prostate cancer. Thank you. Interesting. Um, I, have an, I have another question just about, um, I had, uh, I'm one of the three plus four grade twos in, this, in, the, uh, in the audience tonight. Um, and obviously, you know, you know, there's a there's always the concern of being on the edge of active surveillance in a way. Um, so I guess the question is, does you know, do these tests uh, are the are the way that you look at these the results of these tests different? And you know, do you have different protocols for for low intermediate, you know, favorable intermediate rather than low risk? Again, it has to make sense, um, and so certainly. As a urologist, I feel more comfortable, right? When you you always feel comfortable when you have men who have low risk or in low, very low risk disease, a whiff of Gleason six, you say, ah, you're going to do great, um, even though they sometimes, you know, will progress as well. Um, but you know, three plus four are you know just more controversial, um, and specifically when you look at young men, um, and I'm seeing more and more of these who just have one core with Gleason three plus four. Um, and so, again, sometimes it's just establishing what our goals are. And so I never feel um, bad or truthful, you know, when I sit down at a patient, I said, listen, no one can really predict the future. We're going to do our best. We're going to get all of this type of information and we'll see. But sometimes um, when we have patients who have a three plus four and they're young and you say, hey, it's, it's not necessarily a question that you will progress. You likelihood you probably will, but we're going to intentionally delay your treatment because you're doing fine. There's no signs that aggress. So we'll watch you. And if you do progress, we will treat you, but it's an intentional delay versus a total avoidance versus, you know, some of my older guys who have a little bit more of three plus four. And we say, hey, my goal is still that we totally avoid treatment if possible. So again, it's just setting the goals, you know, differently, but using active surveillance um, for the same purpose, but different goal. Thank you. Is that yeah, yep. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Don't don't ever everybody step all over each other now. <laughs> 
the debate has started. So I think people are getting. Uh, check, check, check the uh, the question window. I think we still have a couple, few folks out there. I, I had I, I had one question that I, I don't know if anybody else asked this, but are there? I mean, what, the picture I'm getting is that maybe everyone should get genetically tested one way or another. But are there specific communities that you think should absolutely? because of the communities that they are get genetic tested because maybe they have a higher a, a higher predisposition to prostate cancer 100 percent. i mean i think um we're realizing and recognizing that you know there are certain higher risk uh populations obviously african americans and the genetics and the frequency of a lot of these mutations are different um so you know there are certain those you know populations itself, um, you know, including that have a lot of African Americans probably should get more genetic testing. Unfortunately, um, it's probably underutilized. Um, Ashkenazi Jews, same, you know, kind of higher prevalence of these, uh, a lot of these mutations um, should probably get screened, uh, potentially using genetic testing more frequently. Uh, we know that the genomic tests uh, perform equally as well, if not better, within African American men. Um, so again, it's something that is another piece of data that we can uh, add uh, to help us better decide. Now we, we've gotten several questions about potentially using older biopsy samples. And I, you know, I know <clears throat> typically, you know, when you have a biopsy, the tissue sample or the slides are stored someplace. So, you know, how, how far back can you go with that and how do people locate their slides? I know when I switched over to you, I had a hard time finding my slides. There'd been consolidation in that industry and I found them in some depository in New Jersey. But, uh, what are, you know, what is the value of, well, no jokes about Jersey, Joe, but, um, you know, how valuable is, is that? Should people be tracking down their old slides and having them having themselves tested? So, you know, every institution will hold on to your samples for at least 10 years. Um, and so a lot of times things will be put into storage or, or kind of held somewhere else, but they generally can be tracked down. Um, now, most companies will say, and again, this is kind of a medical legal thing, that they uh, will only, I think, have tissues within a three-year period. And again, it's not that the RNA or DNA isn't um, viable. It actually is, and, and we, we know because we do it in research all the time, you can go back and still isolate you know, dinosaur DNA um, and still sequence that. So it is very stable, um, but again, it's, it's because of when the tissues uh, were validated they were only validated to a certain time period, so a lot of the companies will not go back further. Now, we, we have sort of a question that's above my pay grade, but maybe it'll make sense to you and you can explain it to those of us who are not in the know. But uh, there's a question about, are there any trials testing monotherapy PRP1 for management of three plus three and three plus four prostate cancer with a BRCA positive signature. Has everybody got that? <laughs> uh, well, the truth is um, I have been trying uh, to convince companies to do this uh, for a while now. Um, and um, because they just got approval, so these PARP inhibitors are chemotherapies, they're oral, um, they're very well tolerated. Um, and they have a good uh, response uh, for men who have specific mutations, uh, usually within BRCA2, um, BRCA1 possibly, uh, uh, men who have DNA damage repair gene mutations, um, for men who have failed chemotherapy. So again, this is the opposite end of the spectrum for men who have advanced prostate cancer, again, usually paired still with hormone therapy. On the other hand is I advocate for saying, hey, maybe um, if you have a type of mutation, whether it's germline or contained within your tumor, 
that you may ultimately respond uh, to a PARP inhibitor, maybe even treat or cure you of your cancer. Um, so it's one of those things that I'm interested in. Um, to my knowledge, uh, there's no approved study as of yet, uh, but if anyone is on uh, this line who um, has some advocacy with uh, these manufacturers and uh, pharmaceuticals, I am uh, certainly interested. Now we, you know, we just Howard, need to emphasize. Howard, uh, yes. Howard, Howard, just one second. I just want to let everybody know, since we still have a large group that's uh, still on the line with us, uh, you know, if Brian's okay with it, I'd like to uh, continue past the 8:30 mark. But uh, we, we, I know he wants to see the debate. So well, we'll, 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 we'll get we'll, we'll get it we'll get everybody off here but i was figuring maybe if we could do another 15 minutes uh, that would probably uh, would handle it because i said well, we have you know, two. yeah we have a lot of questions that some you know a lot of them are very individualized personal questions which i'm not sure that we can be that specific with um and i i was thinking too that we could range outside of the genomics area and do kind of around Robin and uh, other topics. So Howard, before we do, I have one other question from your from your slides, Dr. Helfand, which was when you talked about the uh, somatic DNA test, like do you have an idea of when they, that might actually happen? Because that sounds phenomenally promising. Um, it is, I, I can only say that it's under development as we speak. Um, so, but again, when it comes to commercialization of things, it, it always takes longer than I than I think. Um, but at least on a, you know, the next step ultimately is on a, on a formal prospective trial um, that we look at, you know, kind of management, how it changes, and, and uh, kind of go from there. And and so it certainly uh, seems to be underway. Thank you. There's another question here about. You know, how do circulating stem cells influence genomics? So, um, what we really don't know, you know, stem cells themselves in prostate cancer are extremely rare. So, we don't really look so much at stem cells or stem cell ness of, of most prostate cells or tumor cells in particular. Uh, but certainly, there are um, circulating tumor cells. Um, and or um, cell-free DNA, so DNA from the tumor that you can actually detect within a patient's blood. Uh, these tests are being looked at. Um, there are even some commercially available tests, uh, more reserved usually for men with advanced metastatic prostate cancer that has failed a lot of uh, hormone or chemotherapies. Uh, but certainly even in the realm of active surveillance are being uh, somewhat utilized Again, if in the ideal world, if you could just do a blood test and tell me, hey, I have prostate cancer, I don't, um, and it's from an aggressive type tumor with an aggressive signature, wouldn't that be amazing? Um, and only really biopsy those who uh, would have that, you know, one or those criteria. It's a, it's a dream. I hope to get there one day. We're just not there right now. You know, the audience is not, does not only include men on active surveillance. So, uh, you know, maybe we should uh, ask on behalf of those who've already had radiation treatment or, or um, had radical prostatectomies, you know, does this genomic testing fit in for them? Is this part of what was done before they were treated or does it have any value afterward, you know, for their families or? Well, it, it does, and certainly, um, and I'll use Decipher or Polaris because that's what they offer in that space, is that you know you can still take that tissue um, and isolate an RNA signature. It's a different one that is uh, utilized um, than the one for active surveillance, but there are signatures there that um, can predict um, your chance of having disease recurrence. What are the chances if you need uh, subsequent radiation or hormone therapy that you would respond appropriately? And so that's really where, um, you know, kind of a lot of these companies and the signatures they are developing 
um, are really aimed at. Um, some of them are on a research protocol, uh, but others that you can actually now um, get as part of the report, particularly particularly uh, decipher. Okay. So and that's, uh, again, same with the with the DNA, um, same kind of concept there. So is it okay if we step to the side and ask some other types of questions? Some of these have popped up from uh, the audiences as well. Um, you know, there, there's a feeling that once you get on the active surveillance train that you're on it for the rest of your life. And I know the guidelines vary, but you know, it can mean a lot of biopsies. It can mean, it certainly means a lot of PSAs. I mean, uh, you know, what, what's the situation well, and the guidelines vary. So, you know, what, what, do, what do you recommend for people in their 70s and 80s, or is age not a factor? So, again, age, in my opinion, especially um, in the community I live with, is, is certainly relative. I always joke uh, in the community I live in, uh, people seem to live forever. Um, but I, I mean that in such a positive way and, and saying, hey, it's more important to me that you know, you have predicted good lifespan that you are going to have a good quality of life. And if you are healthy and have very few comorbidities, and the best I can tell, have a uh, good 10 year life expectancy, I do think active surveillance is the appropriate uh, strategy. If any of those things, you know, kind of decline, then we move more to a watchful waiting, hey, wait and see expected management um, as, you know, kind of we're not only going to do something or even biopsy you if you develop symptoms. So I think some of that is also personalized uh, based on how well or not well an individual is doing. Um, certainly when we start off the protocol, as you know, Howard, that um, I was very strict being, hey, the only way we know is uh, based on a biopsy. And even though patients um, were doing really well and all their values were pointing and indicating, hey, you are a total success here, um, initially because the protocol was still indicating uh, to do biopsies. Um, now that we have data um, and that I can say, hey, I feel comfortable looking at our own patients, that there are some guys who every single one of their, the whole gestalt is positive, you know, I, I've, I've softened up. And I still will say, hey, maybe we should get an MRI or continue the blood test. But, I, you know, I, I don't feel as hard pressed um, to do the biopsy because Everything else we've obtained is so, for lack of better terminology, lame, um, and it's so low risk that you know I, I just think we're doing potentially more harm by doing the biopsy at that point. Um, but we still should follow you actively, but it may just not mean the biopsy at that point. Well, I, you know, I can testify that your attitude has changed in the last two or three years. I think I also told you that you might have a rebellion on your hands if you kept doing so many biopsies, just, just based on talking to men like those in the audience. Um, but, you know, in fact, now we had Peter Carroll speak and a lot of us heard um, uh, Lawrence Klotz, the father of active surveillance, both of them are fathers of active surveillance. We heard Klotz at the PCRI and they both said that they want to get out of the biopsy business. So, do you, do you agree? I agree. I, you know, I'm waiting for the day where there's that replacement or that we don't need it, or there's a combination of other non-invasive tests that we can use uh, in its place. I don't think that we're there entirely yet. Um, again, I never want to, wanted to go into medicine to torture patients. Um, again, I do think that it's, it's, um, it's funny how it's funny how often you connect those two words biopsy and torture. Well, it, it's it, it's and for most men, in fairness, it's really not torture or even you know that negative of an experience, but it does have that connotation. And again, there are side effects to anything, and so if we can be less invasive, um, that's the way we want to do it. Um, I, I don't think that there, there are um, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> there are probably still urologists who do enjoy and, and certainly um, have some monetary gain off of it. But really, most people um, should really be thoughtful about who you're going to biopsy or not biopsy. 
Um, one of the, I have a question about um, one of the things that we heard about in the last webinar was um, the subtype, uh, the histological subtype of the pattern four cells in the in a biopsy, um, you know, in the biopsy tissue, and that there was a, a fairly high correlation between that and results of genomic tests. Like, do you think that that knowing having that information from your pathology report is akin to a genomic test in a sense? Yeah, I mean, again, the architecture of a cell is, is largely dependent on what's going on in the proteins there. And I, I think you're specifically looking for things like cribriform or ductal, interductal you know, pathologies, which you know have been associated with more aggressive cancer. So again, that's not the vast majority of patients that will have those. But if you do see them, I think it is akin somewhat to a genomic test. On the other hand is, even within that, there's probably a spectrum of biologies underlying it. And the nice thing is, like a genomic or genetic test, everyone has a value. Um, and so um, that's, you know, when we look at things like cribriform or even perineural invasion, not everyone has that. So if you don't have it, it doesn't mean you don't have an aggressive cancer. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'd like to throw in another quick thing too. Um, we've heard a series of of urologists and patients talking about uh, transrectal versus transperineal uh, biopsies. Do you do you have a preference in what you do? Um, we are actually have a trans uh, perineal biopsy kind of starting trial. Um, historically, we've always done, and this is just uh, my personal preference and just the patient experience, um, have always used a trans rectal. Um, trans perineal historically was just a little bit more painful. Historically, was not really readily able to be done in the office. Now, of course, we can, and, and certainly it seems to be better tolerated. Um, the potential advantage of is that when you're going through the prostate, um, it's easier to get to the anterior higher portions um, that you may get a better sampling, a cross-sectional um, sampling throughout the prostate, um, and so your errors may be less. Um, the question is, is that how much bang for the buck are you getting? Um, is it improving our accuracy? And is it improving, and which is part of it, but the patient experience through it? Are there any downsides? Are there any downsides to it other than the patient experience <laughs> slash torture? <laughs> There are, there is a uh, potentially higher risk of having, um, you know, significant blood in the urine and or pain afterwards. The decreased risk of having infections um, because, again, you're not going through the rectum, um, you're going through skin, which you can kind of clean off. So um, that's a potential advantage there. So, you know, I think it's about time to wrap. Joe, wrap. Yep. <laughs> All right. So I'll uh, thank uh, Brian, Dr. Halfan, again for taking the time on a night where you have many choices for amusement, including uh, Major League Baseball and, and the Biden and Trump show. We thank you for spending some of your time with us tonight. And I want to thank the uh, backstage crew including uh, Alex Jett, Ken Mason, Jake Hannum, and Rich Jackson. Uh, you will, everybody in the audience will be getting follow-up information with uh, a link to watch the video as well as a, a link to download the slides, something that some of you seem desperately to want. So at this point, I think I'll turn it, turn it over to Bo. Yep. Thanks very much uh, to you, Dr. Helfman, and to all of you who are with us and all who helped put, us, put this together. My name is Bo Stubblefield Tave. I'm the executive director of Us Two International. Uh, I think this was a very important program, and I want to mention another that's coming up for those of you who want more information on prostate cancer, genetics, and genomics. Us Two will be doing a program this on Thursday, October 15th. Uh, a different set of perspectives, Heather Chang, who is a medical oncologist, and Katie Stoll, who is a genetic counselor, 
uh, looking at some of this same issues from a different angle. So I hope you'll join us then and continue to watch the remaining two programs in this series. Thanks again. And Rick, Rick Davis, here we go. Here I am. Um, in, in the flesh. In the flesh. So, um, so Bo mentioned two more programs, and uh, I'm surprised at this crew that they didn't get it in before, that we, we have two more coming up um, with Dr. Westfall, and then the um, highly renowned, infamous Dr. Epstein, who everybody sends their slides to for a second reading, uh, coming up in, in um, I think, November and December. If you are listening to this, you will definitely get a reminder. Um, Dr. Helfand, um, I have to admit, I was the author of the Monotherapy Park question, and this could be your lucky night because um, it was actually, it, it's a sad story and I'll tell it you offline, but it's, it was actually my intervention that initiated the profound study at UCSF, um, which approved, which got uh, Recaprib approved just recently in I think 2015. And um, I would be happy to introduce you to Clovis. Um, and once I do that, it's all in your hands. But we'll talk, we'll talk off, uh, offline and, and maybe we can make something happen. Um, I, I... Go ahead. I know I said I would love it. I would absolutely love it. It'd be, it would be our pleasure as some payback for what a, for a terrific talk. Um, secondly, I just want to highlight the most, the, your best line of the evening for me, which is this is no longer 1960s medicine. You are so right. And this is why we run so many groups. And this is what we try to teach everybody who is a participant in our group, that you are your best advocate. And um, if some of you go to our website and you look in our shop, you might even find a t-shirt or a uh, sweatshirt that says just that. And on that note, I want to thank you so much. We will try and get one of those sweatshirts sent to you. We will work on that. Extra large? <laughs> uh, perfect. <laughs> perfect. OK. I, 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 I think he's large, actually. <laughs> OK. All right. So thank you so much, everybody. And come back, visit with us again when we have our next uh, when we have our next active surveillance session. Bye-bye. Good night. Thanks. Good night. Everyone have a good one. Thanks again. Yeah, Brian, if you're still there, thank you. Uh, great job, guys. Are we start do we stop recording? I'm 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 going to hit that in a moment. Can't can't you actually have it edited to take off those first nine minutes? Well, the answer is you can, but it's a lot of work to do it. Um, if you ask Jake, he'll explain to you. So we prefer not to have to edit. We can edit stuff in and out, but it's an, it's an awful lot of work because it has to be downloaded. And that takes a, it, 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 and then it has to be run through. Um, so we can tell you from prior experience. Um, now, Mr. Carmen may have this Jake, question. Jake, 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 can you can you can you hit the stop on the uh, record, please? Well, I've only seen the exit. I can only let's be exit totally out. I don't want to do that. Oh, well, Peter, thanks for your help. I didn't know you were there. I would have thanked you. We think you 